Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Mike Flynn, president of Law Celebrates Caravac. I know we had some people come in. Some of some you were here for the screening we just did, and uh, some of you just came in. I want to welcome everyone to one of our uh, big events for Law Celebrates Caravac. It's really our keynote, and uh, it's our long-standing, ongoing partnership with the Moses Greeley Parker Lecture Series. I'd like to recognize Paul Lappin, who's over here, uh, and thank uh, you for this uh, long-standing tradition of uh, of presenting a lecture, you know, during Low Celebrate Caraway. The Parker Lecture Series is probably, if not the one of, if not the oldest uh, uh, running lecture series here in the city of Lowell, and uh, they put on events uh, all throughout the year, so you can check them out at Parker Lectures. Dot com and there are a few coming up uh, in this month of October, so uh, I highly recommend that if you are uh, local. But I'm very excited to present our Low Celebrates Kerouac 2023 Fall Festival uh, keynote uh, address this year by a guy who, if you were in uh, the room for the screening we just did of Go On from the Literary Odyssey of Jack Kerouac, uh, you may have caught a glimpse of him in, uh, have a speaking role. in younger <laughs> days, right? Um, at the, at the dedication of the Kerouac Commemorative, but uh, he's, he's a, uh, a very important figure in the Kerouac world, but also here in uh, the literary world of the city of Lowell. Uh, he's, he's the, uh, the uh, editor of uh, Kerouac's early writings called The Top in Underwood. He's the founder of Loom Press and, uh, and also the author of the book Mill Power about the uh, modern revitalization uh, of Lowell. Uh, so it's uh, fantastic to present to you uh, today's presentation, uh, Jack Kerouac's evolving uh, position in Lowell, 1950 to 2023, and our Parker Lecture keynote speaker, Mr. Paul Maron. Well, thank you for that kind uh, introduction and what a fantastic collection of human beings we have here. Uh, this is really a, a tremendous turnout. 25% uh, of my high school class is here, so <laughs> really helped fill the seats. So uh, I want to add my thanks to Paul Lappin and, and, the, and the Parker Lectures, which is uh, uh, really an institution in Lowell uh, going back to 1917. Uh, and the series is as vital today as it ever was. Uh, you know, they've had amazing things in the past. One of the things that stuck out, Paul may remember the name, but uh, I guess in the 1920s, they had one of the famous uh, North or South Pole explorers, who was, you remember? I was it here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, but he was like a big deal. Right? It was like uh, Neil Armstrong, you know, in the snow. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they do a couple dozen events every year, and really, it's a fantastic way, uh, you know, for people to uh, see uh, visiting writers and, and uh, you know, performers and so forth. So thank you. And thank you to uh, uh, Low Celebrates Kerouac for extending the uh, invitation, Steve Eddington uh, and Mike Flynn, uh, you know, have been helpful uh, all along. Steve also, uh, helped me with some uh, uh, tricky research points as I was uh, putting uh, my notes together. And I want to also acknowledge uh, my, uh, my old friend in Chicago, John Souter. Some of you know that he wrote uh, The Poets on the Peaks about the uh, uh, Gary Snyder, Philip Whalen, and Jack Kerouac as far as lookouts uh, in the Northwest. And uh, uh, John, uh, I'm not revealing anything, because uh, it's been going on for about 15 years. Uh, he's writing the authorized biography of Gary Schneider, so hopefully he's going to uh, finish uh, soon. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm eager to see it. Uh, so uh, he, uh, he had some fabulous uh, newspaper archive research tools, and uh, he came up with something in particular that I'm going to mention later that uh, uh, shocked me uh, because I've been poking around, you know, the Kerouac material for, you know, since like 1980. And this is something uh, that was in a way right under all our noses. And yet, uh, you know, I had never uh, learned, learned about it. Maybe somebody else here will when I mention it. So uh, Steve, 
Eddington asked me to talk about the, uh, uh, the evolving position or evolving perception of Jack Kerouac in Lowell uh, from 1950 to uh, the present. Uh, in order to kind of fill out uh, my uh, argument or whatever, uh, I actually went back further to the 1930s, but uh, uh, you know, it's a, it, it, I, I think it's actually helpful uh, to think about it uh, in, in those terms uh, because Kerouac was known in Lowell from the middle of the 1930s. Uh, and I'll, I'll go into that. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're here to uh, kind of talk about this. Uh, this, this odd uh, arc of the Kerouac uh, reputation in Lowell. You know, they, they just saw this film very national in scope, like fantastic job, whatever. This is like, shh, Lowell, you know, and uh, what is it about Lowell and Jack Kerouac? Uh, and uh, <clears throat> not to pick on uh, Billy Collins. People know Billy Collins, the poet? Yeah. Yeah, okay, and not to pick on him, but, uh, uh, he, he wrote a poem that he published in the 1988 that uh, you know sums up a little bit about the uh, uh, the conflict in the way low people uh, for a long time you know re regarded Jack Kerouac. The poem is called Lowell Mass, and uh, uh, I didn't know anything about it until I got a Xerox photocopy. Uh, from Nancy Donahue, whose name is on this building, uh, and Nancy sent me one page, Xerox, with this, you know, uh, poem by Billy Collins called Lowell Mass, it, and it, it turns out it appeared in his first book, uh, which was published by University of Arkansas Press, you know, of course now he's like Billy Collins, you know, published in New York, and every book of poems is, is, a, is a national event, which, which is rare for, for a poet, uh, but, you know, he's, somewhat of a household name, but he, he was not then. <clears throat> and so he published this, this poem. He never reprinted it. He never republished it. You know, he said like three selected poems, collected poems, dissected poems. Uh, and um, I always remembered it. And, and one of the things I've been doing lately is working as a, a co-editor of an annual literary magazine called The Low Review. Uh, with Dick Howe, who's here, uh, and um, we were collecting material for uh, the uh, third, the, the, the second issue, uh, which coincided with the uh, Kerouac Centennial, and so we had a special section on Kerouac, so I said, I'm going to write to Billy Collins, and I'm going to ask him if we can use the poem, because nobody in Lowell knows that he wrote a poem called Lowell, right? So uh, he could have been a nicer guy, you know, sent me like eight emails uh, from Florida, and he said, uh, I can't think of a better place for this poem to be. But anyway, I think, uh, you know, he, he, he puts his finger on uh, a kind of attitude about Lowell. Now, uh, his, his father and mother were born in Lowell. He's from, he's like Lowell family, the Collinses, I don't know if she's related to the old uh, vocational school superintendent, but uh, uh, he's, you know, Collins from Lowell. Uh, his father and mother were both born in 1901. They moved away uh, toward, like, uh, uh, Long Island. He was born, you know, uh, in Long Island, not in Lowell. He's never been to Lowell, although, you know, he says he would like to come here. So maybe, you, you know, LCK wants to invite him. Uh, uh -huh. So. Uh, here it is. Kerouac was born in the same town as my father, but my father never had time to write on the road, let alone drive around the country in circles. He wrote notes for the kitchen table and a, lot of, and a novel of checks and a few speeches to lullaby businessmen after a fat lunch. And some of his writing is within me, for I house catalogs of jokes and handbooks of advice and horses, snow tires, women, 
along with some short stories about the deadbeats at the office. But he was quicker to pick up a telephone than a pen. Like Jack, he took to drink, but beatific to him meant the Virgin Mary. He called jazz jungle music, and he would have told Neil Cassidy to let him off at the next light. <laughs> so, it's like you had, you had Kerouac and like non-Kerouac. Uh, I, I, I created a kind of outline for uh, how I was going to look at uh, Kerouac's uh, life. But be, before that, though, uh, I wanted to give a very unscientific uh, uh, personal family story of Kerouac uh, that uh, I, I think is indicative of, you know, a a common view, uh, you know, in the the. the the 20th century. I mean, my, so my parents were contemporaries of Kerouac. My father was uh, three years older, and my mother was uh, uh, one one year older, and, and she was actually in school with him uh, while he was at St. Louis uh, School. Roger Brunel somehow stole a class list uh, out of there, and uh, he showed it to me. And there was my mother's name, and there was Jean Kerouac, uh, but. Um, I, I grew up never hearing the name. It was like, you know, Kerouac, uh, it didn't exist, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and then, you know, uh, one of my, my mother's brothers, uh, he and uh, Reggie Lett, who was a friend of, of uh, Roger Brunel's, they used to tell the story of walking little Jack Kerouac home after school. Uh, so, so he was a person, you know, in their, you know, in their life, but uh, not not memorable, uh, apparently. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I became my, my friend Paul Brulette is really the one who introduced me, you know, to, to Jack Kerouac. It was 1969, and we were sophomores at Drake High School in October. Uh, little son, front page, Kerouac dies. And uh, I may not have this exactly right, but uh, but Paul saw it at, at his home, and he asked his parents, you know, who is this guy, you know? And uh, I guess they they knew, but they didn't know too much about him. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that same year, or maybe the year after, uh, actually, we had a very progressive history teacher at Drake High School named. Uh, uh, Madeline uh, McLaughlin, then Madeline Nealon, and she introduced a uh, uh, an elective on Lowell and Drake and history. Uh, and this was like the early seventies, and you know things were just starting to perk at Lowell. You know the idea of uh, rediscovering the city's history. She tapped into that, and uh, you know Kerouac was mentioned in, in that course. But I was still, you know, I was playing baseball and. Uh, listening to the Beatles and you know uh, it was it wasn't until I got to college that I started to uh, read more seriously and uh, you know uh, began to investigate you know Jack Kerouac you know uh, uh, and uh, you know I, I, I think you know that that anecdote uh, you know uh, is again indicative of a kind of larger consciousness or non-consciousness you know in in the in the city, uh, uh, so I I I split the uh, uh, oh I had one, one other story from my wife Rosemary's side of the family. This is from around 1970. So Kerouac dies 1969, and the Lowell Library has some kind of a raffle or a contest, and Rosemary's grandfather, who was a big reader. Uh, and he and uh, Rosemary's mother had gone to Kerouac's funeral, so they were like clued in. Um, and he won for a prize, you know, in, in the raffle of the contest. And so they said, you know, Mr. Foley, you know, come to the library, pick up your, you know, your prize. And uh, it turned out it was a paperback copy of uh, Maggie Cassidy. Uh, and, and Rosemary's grandfather said, What's second prize? <laughs> uh, but he ended up, he took the book and he, and he gave it to his son, 
Joe Foley, who uh, uh, went to Columbia, got a PhD, uh, is from Lowell. Uh, you know, sometimes people think, you know, Lowell is like a, uh, 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 you know, just a, kind of a, uh, a, an open field for knuckleheads, but, uh, you know, you know, Kerouac in 19, you know, 39 went to Columbia. People, you know, were going to Ivy League schools from Lowell High School. You know, there was a professional class here and so forth. Uh, uh, but, you know, it, it, uh, it, it doesn't mean that it was automatically, there was a, uh, uh, a kind of a built-in readership for Kerouac, and, and, and I'll talk about that. So, um, so the, the first, Trash, as they say, is uh, 1938 to 1949, and, and I call it uh, Local Jock Makes Good, uh, uh, to 49, I'm sorry. Um, and it's interesting to think about Kerouac, because he was a shy guy or whatever, but uh, you know, in, in, in 1935, he, he, uh, he, he wrote a, a, a kind of ad uh, to the Lowell Sun, uh, uh, challenging other teams to a, a, a football game. Uh, it was October 35, uh, and uh, you know he's 13 years old. You know, you know but his group, uh, you know, wants to you know engage some other team, and it's like, uh, okay, oh yeah, I'm the writer, and so he 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 does it, uh, uh, and of course sports, uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, Somebody mentioned, you know, a Kerouac working class writer. I mean, working class, you know, especially boys, you know, but also young girls too. Uh, sports uh, was a way up and out. Uh, it was a way to distinguish yourself. And and Kerouac uh, was a joiner. You know, he you know he played in the the neighborhood of Drake and Tiger's Field. He, he writes about all that. And then. Uh, you know, he, he joined, uh, there, was, there was a baseball league called the Twilight League, uh, and John Souter found a, uh, a, a box score, I mean, just like the Red Sox, uh, uh, from a game in 1938. Uh, it was actually a, uh, it was a doubleheader in a sense that Kerouac's team, the A&P grocery store team, uh, they played a double header, but they played a different team in, in each in each game. Uh, and one of the things that stuck out to me is, uh, you know, again in the very professional box score, uh, Kerouac uh, stole a base in each game. You know, so here's Jack Kerouac, the uh, the runner. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, a lot of us are familiar with, uh, you know, his uh, uh, triumphs in high school, uh, both in track, and then he had. <coughs> Excuse me. He has that spectacular moment in the Thanksgiving game against Lawrence in 1938, and uh, you know it's like a, a, a switch, you know, uh, goes on, and you know he's he's like a local hero. You know, he scores a winning touchdown, um, and uh, in those days, local sports was heavily covered, uh, and. Um, uh, then you know the athletes were were like you know, like minor celebrities. So you know when he has a birthday party in the in the spring of 1939, he turns 17. Uh, there's photographs in the newspaper of his like uh, birthday party with with his gang of friends, including you know Mary Carney, who uh, you know was related to the Maggie Cassidy novel. Uh, a little side note on that. Uh, Years later, it might have been in the 70s or something, uh, uh, somebody I knew went looking uh, at the Lowell City Library, the Pollock Library, for a copy of the paper from that day, because he wanted to see, like, who's Maggie Cassidy, you know? Um, and he got there, and the son at the time kept hard copies of all the papers, and he's going through the papers, you know? And uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, he gets to the I don't know, society page or something where they had birthday party pictures and the big hole in the paper. Wow. Yeah. Somebody had gone and cut it out. <laughs> so, um, 
And then, you know, sports becomes the springboard uh, for Kerouac to uh, uh, go beyond Lowell. You know, he, you know, he, he gets an athletic scholarship to Columbia University, he has to, you know, do some preparatory work at uh, uh, Horace Mann School. You know, he protested and said, oh no, it was academic scholarship, it was not a football scholarship, you know. But, you know, I think it was a football scholarship, right? <laughs> so, um, so he, so Jack Kerouac at that point, you know, it was like 1939, uh, he's uh, grown up in Lowell, you know, gone through high school, and he's become like a, a you know, a person, a, you know, a, no, a, a known person. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I didn't see any surveys on it, but I, I assume you know, he was held, you know, in positive regard. You know, he was like a local local boy, uh, you know, who was doing well, uh, and uh, you know, the the nineteen forties boy, pretty much, you know, in the nineteen forties, uh, you know, he Columbia, and then he drops out, Merchant Marine, maybe, uh, but um, you know, he returns in nineteen fifty, and uh, here he is, the, the the conquering literary hero. You know, he's got a, a big fat novel, The Town in the City, published by Harcourt Grace, you know, one of the big New York publishers. The low son gets behind it, you know, had Charlie Sampas, who was always a big booster, uh, you know, you know uh, promotes it, and then they make uh, uh, the book a feature in the, uh, the Sunday Sun magazine. And then he has a, uh, uh, a book signing, you know, at Bois-Mache, which was like the classiest department store, you know, downtown. Uh, and so it's, it's all good, right? You know, uh, you know, he comes back, I, you know, I can't name, maybe uh, Dick Howe or somebody else, I can't name another, like, 20th century person, you know, before 1950, uh, who published a novel you know, a you know, Lowell person, person, even though he was not living in Lowell, but he was, you know, grew up here. Uh, somebody from Lowell would publish a novel, you know, uh, with a big New York publisher. So, it, you know, it was a tremendous achievement. He's 28 years old. So, uh, so the part of the question is, how, 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 how does Jack Kerouac go from this kind of, you know, golden boy, you know, football star, and literary star, uh, you know, down the line, you know, you know, into the fifties and the sixties, uh, to the point where uh, there's there's a kind of uh, consensus in Lowell that uh, you know he's a bum, you know he's. Uh, you know, he's part of that beatnik crowd, uh, and uh, you know, you know, he doesn't represent our values, uh, and and that that persists uh, for for quite a long time. Uh, and uh, one of the things that you know, I'm sort of wrestling with. I, I you know, I, I never really thought that hard about it, you know, but I thought, why, you know, I mean, he wasn't even here. You know, people weren't reading, you know, those avant-garde, you know, prose uh, novels. Uh, the exception maybe being uh, Maggie Cassidy, Charlie Sampas, in his uh, Sampas Scoopy's, uh, uh, you know, daily column, which was kind of like a quirky blogging thing. Uh, in, I think in, well, 1959, that's when uh, Maggie Cassidy was published. You know, he, you know, he, uh, he throws in there, uh, oh, 200 copies of Jack Kerouac's latest novel sold in the bookstore on Main Street, on Merrimack Street. You know, and I, I only saw that by accident because I was researching for an article I was writing about Betty Davis, uh, who's, uh, it was for the UMass Lowell Alumni Magazine, and her mother had attended Lowell Teachers College, uh, um, and it was like enough of a thread, you know, for me to, to, to write a story, but, uh, you know, I was looking in the newspaper archives, and, and this sort of popped out at me, and uh, you know, it sort of stuck with me because I thought, you know, any writer, 
would be thrilled to sell 200 copies of his book in his hometown. You know, so it kind of put the lie, you know, to the cliche that uh, Lowell didn't care about Kerouac. You know, it's like, you know, after the town of the city, uh, uh, that, you know, people just ignored it, you know. Uh, but, you know, th this was a, a, a data point that, that proved otherwise. Uh, but it was an exception, of course, uh, and uh, I, you know, I, there, there wasn't like a countervailing narrative about uh, the significance of Kerouac, you know, while he was like in play, you know, of course he, you know, he, he's gone from the public eye, you know, from 50 to 57, then on the road comes out, you know, fireworks. Uh, but I don't think On the Road was reviewed in Lowell. In fact, I, I you know, I don't recall seeing uh, reviews of any of his books. You know, uh, and he wrote about 10 books, uh, you know, after uh, The Town and the City, uh, you know, before he died. Uh, and, and so, you know, it makes me wonder, because you'd read this stuff in the paper, you know, there'd be Man on the Street interview, it's like, oh, Kerouac, he's a you know, he's, why, you know, who cares about him and so forth. Uh, and, uh, you know, it just makes me think, was it more that he just wasn't on people's minds, you know? And, and then, you know, a reporter here or there, uh, you know, would, uh, would get somebody in a barbershop and, you know, get a response like, oh, Kerouac, you know, he's, he's a bum. They didn't, I mean, he wasn't even around, you know? Uh, Louis Menand has a book, um, what's it called here? Uh, it's, it's about the uh, art in, in, the, uh, uh, in the Cold War period. And he, he writes, he's, he's very, uh, uh, you know, favorable, you know, to the, uh, to the, to the beats. Um, and, uh, I don't see it right here. Uh, oh, yeah, here, here it is. Uh, he says the uh, the constant it was, did I do that? Yeah. Uh, the book is called The Free World: Art and Thought in the Cold War. Louis Menand, he's a professor at Harvard. He's been to UMass Lowell, you know, under like the Kerouac uh, Center umbrella. Uh, but he says the constantly iterated claim that Kerouac and Ginsburg were rebels and hedonists, prone to crime and violence or that they presented themselves as spokesmen for people like that, is such a crude misreading that it's hard not to speculate about why some people found the Beats and their books so threatening. The sadness that soaks through Kerouac's story comes from the certainty that the world of hobos and migrant workers and joy riders uh, was dying. Uh, and uh, you know, he, he later says, uh, the characters that on the road are not hipsters either. Uh, cats too cool for life in suits. There's nothing cool about Dean or Karl or Marx, the Ginsburg character. The characters married, they get legally divorced, they take drugs, they quit them, they talk about Dostoevsky and Hemingway, and write novels and poems and uh, hope for recognition. Uh, the narrator, you know, uh, Kerouac, uh, Cell Paradise, lives with his aunt, who sends him money when he needs a bus ticket to home, otherwise he draws on his GI benefits. The beasts weren't rebels, they were misfits. This is what the best minds section of Howell is saying. The book is not really about sexuality. It has a slightly different subject, which is masculinity. Uh, and he says the beats were men who wrote about their feeling. So it's a really interesting you know, uh, response to a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, sort of typical uh, take, you know, on, on, on Carol and, and the Beats. Uh, um, and, you know, but I wonder, you know, did that, uh, that attitude of, you know, I hate using this word, but, you know, the elites, you know, the, the literary critics and, you know, political commentators, uh, you know, did that seep down, you know, into the consciousness of a of a place like Lowell? You know, there was you know there were some people who were reading Time magazine and the New York Times and you know uh, uh, 
uh, you know, following you know, national news where Kerouac was being written about. It wasn't being written about a Lowell, except an occasional column by Charlie or Mary Sampas. But, uh, uh, you know, did this uh, uh, trashing, you know, of, of the beats, uh, you know, seeing them as barbarians at the gates, you know, did that, did that seep down, you know, into, uh, you know, places like Lowell and Scranton and, you know, uh, you know, cities and communities where, you know, people weren't necessarily paying a lot of attention to Jack Kerouac, but he, you know, he was a newsmaker. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, where that comes from and why, why Kerouac, uh, in a way, got such a bad rap for so long. And uh, at one point, a couple of months ago, you know, I've been thinking about this, uh, and I said to my wife, I said, uh, well, he was a below end, right? Uh, so people who are not from Lowell, you might not recognize that term, but it's a pejorative a term for somebody who wasn't, uh, uh, you know, from here. Uh, you know, in, in you know, kind of authentically, and you know, even though Kerouac was born in Lowell, the Kerouacs were not Lowell people. Uh, they were Nashua people. You know, you know, Steve Eddington has documented all that. So his, you know, Kerouac's parents, as kids, you know, came from Quebec as part of the nine hundred thousand uh, <laughs> migrants, you know, who crossed the border, came into the, uh, uh, you know. Towns and you know, cities, really, of New Hampshire and uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut, uh, and uh, you know they, you know they stopped in, in Nashville, and then you know it's a kind of you know occupational you know sort of accident that Leo Kerouac gets sent to Lowell uh, to be uh, to oversee the French newspaper, uh, and Louise Pelican is here, and it's her grandfather uh, uh, who uh, was the, uh, uh, the publisher of L'Etoile, which was a very uh, uh, substantial, you know, French language newspaper published, you know, it was in uh, Nashville, then they opened an office in Lowell, and um, uh, so Leo Carrack is here around 1910, uh, I guess it is, and uh, he stays you know, uh, involved with Gabrielle Levesque, and uh, they end up getting married, and she comes down with you in 1916, uh, and they're, they're, they're living in Lowell. But uh, my ancestors on both sides uh, came to Lowell in 1880, and French people were coming, you know, you know from the early 1970s, uh, and, you know, by 1916, whenever, uh, you know, uh, they, they got married. Uh, it was a zillion marriages, you know, in Lowell. So there was this whole network of people uh, who, in a way, could have your back, you know. So it, it just made me think, uh, I mean, Kerouac, you know, he, he was Lowell, but it was an inch deep, you know. Uh, <coughs> he had a, uh, excuse me, He had one uncle, and uh, he had a cousin, Hervé, and they played on the baseball team together. But there was no real support system. So even when Kerouac was in absentia, uh, when you know the gossip in the bar and the barber shop, and you know the five and ten, you know if Kerouac's name would come up, and somebody was like, "Oh, you know, he's he's worthless." Uh, he didn't have people like sticking up for him. He, you know, he had some friends from when he was growing up, and the, you know the Sampuses were staunch, you know, uh, always supporters. But uh, that's different, you know, from having like a tribe, you know. And uh, it just it was a it's a way of thinking about Kerouac that uh, hadn't hadn't occurred to me before. And and, uh, and I wondered, uh, you know, could that could that have something to do with the uh, the endurance? of, uh, you know, the, uh, the nasty, you know, uh, reputation, you know, that, that he had. Now, 
you know, fast forward 1967, he comes to uh, live in, in Lowell with, uh, with Stella, who he's married, and his mother. He's in very rough shape. And 67 and 68, they're living on Sanders Avenue in the Highlands neighborhood. And, you know, there's a hundred stories about him, you know, being, you know, out of control, you know, or, you know, a few times being arrested or, you know, you know, people just seeing him, uh, uh, you know, drunk, whatever. Uh, and, you know, those, uh, you know, that like sort of last time around was really unfortunate, uh, you know, in terms of, how he was viewed, and it sort of it confirmed, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the negative sort of instincts that, that people might have had uh, about. It. He didn't help himself, you know. So, uh, so, you know, we and we, you know, so that takes our story up to like 1969, and really in the 1970s. Uh, in the 80s, uh, like a little bit in the 70s, but then in, in the 80s, um, you, I, I wouldn't say it was, uh, you know, an organized effort, but um, uh, there was a new generation of people who uh, took notice of Kerouac and, and started uh, to do things in the community that uh, began to rehabilitate. You know his his relationship, uh, and uh, and one of the things I want to mention today is that I that I discovered is the uh, the first public tribute to Jack Kerouac was uh, in uh, the basement of a, uh, a halfway house of drug users on Upper Merrimack Street. It's called Anabasis House. Anybody here remember? An Abbas's house. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but you know it's 1971, and uh, a group of uh, activists, uh, probably two thirds of them not from Lowell. You know they're like professors from MIT and you know writers from Concord and you know high school teachers from Tewksbury. But then you know some people from Lowell, they organize what they call the Jack Kerouac Free School. And I had never heard of this. <laughs> um, and of course, there was a kind of free school movement, you know, uh, at that time, kind of coming off the teachings, uh, you know, anti-war and civil rights teachings on college campuses, you know, in the 60s, and then it kind of morphed into this uh, free school movement. And, you know, you know, these folks created a free school, you know, in, in the basement of the Navis' house, and, uh, uh, the Lowell Sun ended up writing three articles with photographs, uh, but uh, you know, I never heard of it. Nobody ever mentioned it to me, and it's, I think it's also an object lesson in there's still stuff we don't know, <laughs> right? There's still stuff to discover, uh, and so even if it's just right under our noses. Uh, but yeah, in the early '70s, you know, things begin to. Uh, then to change uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, the perception, the view of Kerouac. Uh, in 1971, uh, Jay McHale, a professor at Salem State College, organizes, I think, the first uh, academic symposium, you know, on beat uh, writing, and he's, you know, he's got all the living beats up there, Ginsburg and Kerouac and so forth, and. And they publish a, uh, the proceedings from the con from the symposium, and and that was a significant step. Um, and then you know for me, uh, you know kind of the big thing in the seventies was uh, Bob Dylan brought the Rolling Thunder Review uh, in November nineteen seventy five, and uh, there's no way they would have come to Lowell if it wasn't for Kerouac. They were here to pay homage to Kerouac. Uh, you know, a lot of us probably have seen the photographs of them uh, at the grave at Edson Cemetery. Uh, there's film footage, and, you know, you go on YouTube, you can find it in about, you know, 10 seconds. Uh, but uh, that was a big deal, uh, and that was, uh, that was national attention, 
you know, on Carrick, but also on Lowell. Uh, and uh, I remember there was a big spread in Rolling Stone magazine, you know, color pictures, you know, Dylan standing up under the cross of the Our Lady of Lourdes Grotto, you know, behind the Franco-American school. Uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was really significant and, and you know, I think raised uh, the profile of Kerouac. Uh, uh, but in 1978, uh, things started to happen. And uh, for the next 10 years, almost every year, you know, uh, it's like something uh, like pushed, you know, the Kerouac car forward in Lowell. In 1978, the Lowell Museum, which used to be in the Suffolk, uh, mill, uh, one Lancet Mill building, you know, down past past the post office in Lowell, uh, they uh, they organized a Jack Kerouac night with, with support of uh, Stella Kerouac, uh, and like 250 people uh, uh, packed themselves, you know, into the uh, into the museum space, and there was like another hundred outside. They had to get the fire chief to come and tell people we can't let anybody else in, you know. But it, but it showed that there that, that there was interest in and you know Lou was in his twenties and you know Bob McLeod was in his twenties they were kind of hotshot history guys you know from uh, from UMass Lowell uh, and that kind of started you know the, the ball rolling in 1980 uh, there was an arts co-op called Art Alive uh, Susan Gaylord was the president and um, the, uh, the the artists there who were you know kind of the uh, uh, you know, the leading edge of the, you know, we didn't know the name creative economy, you know, then, but, you know, they were, uh, they were out there in the community uh, and they formed this co-op and uh, they put on a, a Kerouac event. Uh, and uh, again, they drew like 200 people, you know, they had speakers, they played uh, tapes from Vi uh, Visions of Cody. Uh, and uh, I, I should back up a little bit uh, in 73, uh, three, the Lowell Technological uh, Institute professor, English professor, Charles Jarvis, published a biography uh, called Visions of Kerouac. This, and this was like a little bit after Ann Charters, you know, came out with, with her biography. So that was, you know, that was, you know, that was important in terms of people, you know, seeing Kerouac. And you could, you know, you could get it in, in the supermarket because he was friends with, uh, Mr. DeMoulis, you know, who ran all the supermarkets. So in those days they were called DeMoulis, but you have the market basket now. Uh, so you'd see, you know, stacked of, uh, you know, uh, Jarvis's book uh, at, at the supermarket. Um, so, uh, you know, we have the Art Alive events in 81, and then uh, in the audience here uh, is Charlie Gargiulo in 1982. Uh, uh, he worked with the public library to get a uh, uh, a cultural grant, you know, we called it, from the Lowell Historic Preservation Commission, which was helping the Park Service develop, you know, the park in Lowell. <clears throat> and uh, they published a, uh, like a large format, uh, you know, guide to Kerouac's Lowell with a map, and Charlie wrote an essay, uh, it was, and it was very popular. And again, you know, kept the momentum going. Uh, and around that time, another guy who got a cultural grant was John Antonelli, you know, who uh, was from Tuxby originally, but he was in California. Uh, but he applied for funding for script development for his, uh, I guess what you'd call it, like a docudrama, you know, about, about Kerouac, as he had actors, but also, you know, documentary footage. And then we showed that uh, at the Merrimack Repertory Theater and uh, there were two showings. They were both sold out with like 350 seats each time in the same night. Uh, it was premiering at the Orson Welles Cinema in, uh, uh, in Cambridge. Uh, and then, uh, you know, around 1985, I guess, uh, you know, Brian Foy and uh, a, a group of uh, people who felt that uh, Lowell should do more, you know, with Kerouac. Uh, they created a nonprofit organization called Lowell. Well, it was called the Corporation for the Celebration of Jack Kerouac and Lowell. Uh, and that got shortened to Lowell Celebrates Kerouac, Inc. Uh, but it was really significant. And uh, they organized, uh, I believe it was St. Patrick's Day, 1986. 
It was a fundraiser, you know, in the Merrimack uh, uh, Repertory Theater space, you know, and uh, Alan Ginsberg and uh, Greg Corso were there, and was you know standing room only, you know, big, you know, uh, big audience, uh, and you know, so all these things were uh, were proving that there was interest in Kerouac and that people were feeling you know, pretty good or interested enough to come out and learn more about it and, and uh, uh, be seen you know, uh, you know, at a Kerouac event. Um, and uh, uh, a group of us went up to Quebec City in 1987 and participated in the uh, International Jack Kerouac Conference up there. Uh, and you know that was another uh, you know sort of benchmark thing. And at that time, we had uh, the LCK folks, Roger Bernal particularly. You know he had uh, you know brokered these relationships with the writers and musicians in Montreal and Quebec, and they would come you know for the festival in October. You know and uh, it was tremendous. You know it gave an international flavor uh, to it. Uh, and and. Uh, you know, the kind of the beat goes on until 1987, and that's when, excuse me, the decision is made to, uh, uh, you know, build the, the Jack Howard commemorative. Uh, and, you know, that was a significant undertaking. Uh, it really came out of the, uh, the larger Lowell Public Art Collection uh, project that uh, uh, Paul Saunders had been been pushing and we had been doing like one like major <coughs> public art piece a year, which was crazy. But anyway, uh, you know we uh, you know we could, we got that going and Ben Boitano was selected and then uh, you know people who were here for the film earlier saw the uh, the dedication you know in uh, in June of of 1988 um, and uh, you know. That, I, I, in, in my outline here, I call that uh, the grassroots hero, uh, because nearly all of what I just described was from the bottom line. It wasn't like, you know, City Hall or, uh, you know, the Chamber of Commerce or, you know, some institution was, uh, you know, sort of seeding, you know, this idea of do more with Kerouac. Really, it came out of a whole bunch of different, you know, committee organizations, including the Franco American Day Committee. They had a Kerouac night, um, and and so, uh, you know, by the time you know we got to uh, the Kerouac commemorative, uh, there were three public votes. Uh, two were unanimous, and one was seven to one. Uh, there's nine city councilors, but somebody was missing. Uh, and you know, one city councilor really objected, you know, to the idea of uh, uh, paying tribute to Kerouac because he was a, a bad uh, uh, example of a human being. <coughs> um, but the the media the media seized on you know the controversy, uh, and, and you know, it was everywhere. You know, big articles. Uh, National attention, Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, you know, of course the Boston media. Uh, you know, George Will wrote a, a, a whole page in Newsweek magazine, kind of a snarky thing called, Hey Daddy, who was Kerouac? You know, it's like, George Will? <laughs> so, uh, in, anyway, I, I had a Wall Street Journal reporter come to me one day, and she said, Oh, you know, Tell me about the controversy. I said, well, you know, you've got the, the wrong end of the story. I said, the story here is consensus. And I told her, you know, the three votes, two unanimous, you know, seven to one, and uh, a whole history of community events, you know, kind of recognizing Kerouac. And she said, uh, oh, well, you know, my editor doesn't want that. He wants the controversy. <laughs> so, I mean, the controversy ended up getting us, you know, piles of uh, uh, press, and some people say no press is bad press. Um, but anyway, so that, that takes us to, to, to 1988. Uh, 
And then to be the, you know, the next, you know, kind of tranche is 1988 to 2007. Uh, and I call that mainstreaming the author. And uh, at that point, you know, Lowell celebrates Kerouac is like uh, an annual thing. You know, it's uh, it's you know it's talked about with the other festivals in the city. Um, you know, the, the the LCK committee, you know, is doing its work. Uh, you know, all year really, they do an event in March. Uh, we got Mitt Romney to sign uh, a, a, a proclamation, you know, making uh, March 12th Jack Kerouac Day in Massachusetts every year, you know. So whoever's governor is supposed to sign and uh, and deliver that, you know, to to, to Lowell. Uh, so you know, you know, during that period, uh, you know, Kerouac was, you know, in some ways, he was rehabilitated, and now. You know, was kind of moving into the mainstream, you know, of, of the uh, cultural life of the city, and I, you know, I guess you know, the culmination of that is the uh, uh, the commemorative, you know, and uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, centennial, and uh, you know, the scroll comes back, you know, the you know big exhibit, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I should have mentioned you know, in 87, 50th anniversary of On the Road, the scroll came, it was huge, 25,000 people came to the events, you know, that summer, uh, but the scroll comes back, you know, for the centennial, uh, there's banners, you know, they may still be up, I don't know, they were up for a long time, you know, on the street gone. poles, you know, for Jack <laughs> Kerouac, which, you know, again, it's, it's one of these uh, indicators, you know, that, that he's part of the regular life of the city, you know, he's on, he's on the street, Polls, you know, um, and then um, uh, you know, s uh, you know the the activities continue, uh, and now the que I think the question is, you know, where 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 does it go from here? You know, I mean, I I, I joke that you know Jim's involved with the, the Carroll Cathedral project, you know, at Saint John Baptiste. Uh, church uh but it's a big idea you know it's a it's uh i don't know you know the right person could just write a check and it could happen you know but um you know i i think uh, you know the case has been made you know uh that uh you know Kerouac has a, a permanent place in Lowell. i mean i i think he's on the way to you know something like you know thoreau in concord you know where you know it's just an iconic part of the Concord, you know, town uh, consciousness and, and, and identity. Uh, and I think part of the reason that, you know, that can happen is because uh, uh, Kerouac is a spiritual writer. You know, it's, it's not just the true story novels about, you know, his adventures. Uh, but one of the things that makes him different is that uh, he has all this uh, uh, scriptural writing and, uh, you know, of course, you know, that's also in, you know, a, a lot of the other books too, but, you know, you know, when somebody, you know, writes scripture, the golden eternity, or, uh, uh, you know, some of the Dharma, or the, the, the biography of the Buddha, wake up, uh, you know, he's putting himself in a, in a different category. And, you know, Steve Eddington has written about this in his book about, you know, Kerouac and spirituality. So, um, so I, I think you all have done good. You know, I'm out of here now. You know, but I'm still involved in talking to people. But uh, it's great to see, you know, the wheel keeps turning. Uh, and uh, you know, you should all give yourself a hand. For that. I just, you know, we probably have time for the take some questions. So. You know, maybe, you know, it's, it's almost three, but maybe 15 minutes. Yeah, and, yeah. I'm just wondering about Kerouac and um, if, if he's taught in local, the local schools and how we, young people in the community are exposed to Kerouac. I mean, has Kerouac been incorporated into the curriculum in any way in high schools? Or well, that's something that you could yeah, I don't know about now. It used to be when Brian Foy used to teach Kerouac 
at Millsex Community College, and at one time there was an English department elective on Merrimack Valley Writers, and he was in there. UMass Lowell, uh, once a year or you know once every other year, you know has a a, a Kerak course you know in the English department you know catalog. Uh, I I don't know what what's going on. I I know well, this group. Uh, you know, every, what is it, the, the Thursday morning of the Kerouac Festival, they go to Lowell High School and they run the spoken word contest and there's, you know, you know, scads of uh, young people who are involved there, but, uh, yeah, Steve. Yeah, I um, just want to say, I, um, uh, I've been sitting too long. I got to stretch my legs up. I really appreciated what, and, and your present. Well, thank you. The whole thing was, was, was wonderful. I really appreciated what you said mm -hmm. about how building the commemorative and getting it all going was a grassroots sort of bottom up kind right. of a uh, right. kind of a movement. And I'd say that, and that's still the case with uh, with Lowell celebrates with Kerouac. You know, we are we're we're a group of volunteers that come together every year to put on a festival. Um, no staff, no office. You know, we just we just do what we do, and I kind of got I, I like that. Sometimes we think, you know, does Lowell need to, do we need more civic involvement? On one hand, we do. On the other hand, speaking strictly for myself now, I kind of like it being funky. You know, <laughs> we, we, we come together. What are we going to do? What are we going to do this year? Where, where are we going to get the money to do it? And who do we want to bring in? It's a, it, it continues to be a lot of fun. So I've always sort of got mixed feelings about it. Do we want to keep it kind of yeah, well, grassroots funky, or do we want to go somewhere? Yeah, I, 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 like it, your thoughts you know, on it, that. It has some of the vibes of... You know the beats, the, the beats before they, you know, kind of made headlines. You know when they were starting out, there was a, a kind of, uh, you know, make it up as we go. Uh, <laughs> you know, guerrilla. You know, at the six gallery reading, you know, in San Francisco, and you know they, you know, made a bull cards and invite people, uh, and then you know, like a lot of things, then it, you know, in, in you know, in, to a certain degree, Kerouac here, you know, it gets professional. You know, and uh, you know, there's something gained and something lost. In yeah, that. exactly. You know, I mean, some of my best memories of the Lowell Celebrates Kerouac are the uh, events in the back room of the Rainbow Cafe. You know, <laughs> on Saturday afternoons, and they put a cover on the pool table, and they have all these like homemade, you know, Lowell and Franco American foods, and it was a, it was an open mic, and you know, people just. Uh, you know, uh, came and, and, and enjoyed it, you know, so, uh, but there's been, you know, there's been other, you know, parts of this whole thing, like, you know, having Patty Smith at the Fifth Baker Center and, uh, you know, big uh, uh, panel discussions in the, you know, the uh, the meeting room uh, on top of the boot mills. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I think it's a pretty interesting blend of, uh, uh, you know, kind of guerrilla, you know, and, uh, you know, some, you know, more uh, formal, right. if you want to say that, you know, so. Uh, you yeah, need to give right. people time to go with it. Well, this, I think uh, you're being yeah. too modest about your role in the building of the park mm. and the commemorative. And maybe, yeah. um, I mean, no, you, you really had like the literary sensibility and the political savviness where you were working at the, you know, for Fred and for, uh, in, for Dr. Mogan, um, and you were able to really bring those together and, and have a real driving force to get that done. So, Thanks maybe, you, no, absolutely. I mean, I think yeah. the, the probably, you know, besides Kerouac, the most critical person to, for us to have a park there, uh, Richard Scott, of course, as well, too, but, but you, were there, was there a point where you thought it wouldn't get done? I remember there was a part, well, there was a part, wasn't there, like for a month, the Coast Guard had to come in and do a study of the water because we there was a bridge, go, yeah. there was a bridge over the Eastern Canal behind it. Like were, there was some, were there times where you thought the park wouldn't get built? Yeah, I, I, I had a bunch of sleepless nights, <laughs> mostly because of the budget, and uh, it was a very complicated administrative arrangement mm -hmm. where uh, the Preservation Commission uh, awarded a hundred thousand dollars to the city planning department, uh, which was overseeing uh, the, uh, the development of the grassy park, uh, but also involved was the uh, Heritage State Park. Lowell has a national park and a Heritage State Park that had like different assignments, but at, at the time, 
the Heritage State Park uh, was involved because uh, the state money uh, was made available to knock down the Great Gray Warehouse of Eternity. <laughs> and, and so the State Heritage Park people, you know, that was like their piece of the action. You know, so it's, you know, there was this sort of complicated, you know, management structure. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a clock ticking all the time. And, and particularly, you know, for the, for the, he's not here, so on, on the, the Ben Tenna, you know, design uh, was, uh, was over budget, uh, uh, and uh, it was it was chosen, you know, uh, as you know the the, uh, the favorite you know design. Despite that, uh, but we had to uh, cannibalize the uh, the Grassy Park development money to pay for. Uh, the stone paper, the plaza, you know, of, of the of the Kerouac commemorative, and the uh, some some other things, you know, that were over and above, you know, the uh, the, the sort of the cost of the artwork. So, uh, you know, and, and that money had to be spent by a certain period. So it was, you know, there, it was I I had forgotten about the Coast Guard. You know, <laughs> it doesn't yeah it doesn't surprise me that they were involved. You know, so, but uh, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, you know, behind the, behind the scenes, it was a, it was a complex thing to pull off, and you know we were just lucky that uh, there was nobody or no group, you know, of political people or whatever, who were just sort of waiting for us to screw up to like knock the whole thing over, you know. So you know we you know we uh, uh, you know we we were given a lot of leeway, you know, particularly by the. Uh, uh, Andy Trudell, the, uh, uh, the project manager, the uh, Division of Planning and Development. Yeah, Janet. Oh, I just want to take you back to 56. In 1956, September, my first days at Mass Art, and I said I was from Lowell, Mass, and my classmates said, oh, that's where Jack Kerouac is from. They were from Quincy, and yeah. I said that was the first I heard of it. And then, of course, <laughs> from those few Years after that, my mother said you turned into a beatnik. Yeah. You know, all the artists. Right. So right. That was. Yeah. yeah that uh, was, everybody knew about it, but us. That's right. And and Dobie Gillis with Maynard G. Cripps. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Bob, for, for this. I'm just wondering, um, thinking about like Kerouac or what Kerouac did for Lowell too, like in reverse in terms of his writing. I mean, in your beautiful edition of Top and Underwood, where he takes us back to his earlier days and yeah. some of the, you know, writings about being in Lowell, what it felt to be here, and also, you know, reading the novels and then arriving here, it feels like you were arriving inside a Kerouac novel, so that because of the accuracy with which he wrote and remembered what it was like to live here, down to the the geometry of the bricks and, and the angles of the canals, and so that way he had a preserving Lowell in literature. I wonder if you could speak about that. Is that something that uh, you know attracted you to him, or is this something that um, because it is kind of a gift in the same way that you know Joyce captured Dublin, 1904. Yeah. He captures a Lowell that in many ways is no longer here, but in parts of it is still here. Yeah. So that aspect of it is always found uh, you know very yeah. profoundly moving to me. So uh, thank you for that. It, it was the main thing that attracted me. Uh, I you know I had begun writing. You know, short stories and some poems. I didn't know much about, uh, about Kerouac, but I, <clears throat> I started to read, you know, what I call the low novels, and you know, I got hooked. You know, and when I brought Dr. Sachs home for my father to read, uh, he was like laughing, howling out loud because he had never seen in print the French language uh, kind of sounded out the way Kerouac does, uh, you know, in a book. And it, it was incredibly, like, validating for him, you know, to see. Here was this book, you know, read all over the world, and it was, you know, here's this, like, local French, you know, that was, uh, you, know, it, you know, like Kerouac, it was his first language. And, and so, 
uh, you know, again, being 100%, you know, French Canadian, you know, I keyed in, you know, to the, uh, uh, you know, the French, you know, element, background, texture, you know, of, of the, the, the Kerouac books, uh, you know, particularly uh, Dr. Saxon, Visions of Gerard. Uh, it took me three times to get through on the road. Uh, you know, I uh, admire it, it. You know, it's an achievement, accomplishment, but um, I actually like Dharma Bums better, you know, than on the road. Uh, but uh, I understand that, you know, that's, you know, Jack Kerouac's Huckleberry Finn and Moby Dick and, uh, you know, Scarlet Letter, you know, is, is on the road. And, you know, great, more power to him, you know, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, he wrote those other books. Yeah. Yeah, Jim. So, uh, how about the Merrimack Repertory Theater 2017, uh, The Haunted Life? I mean, I was really oh, yeah. shocked by that, to be right. honest with you. The, the showing, the amount of people that came to Right, it. yeah, I and, mean, I... And, and it's, like you have said, I mean, it's not, I actually like it a lot, but I, it, it isn't his best work. Yeah. It's something that had to be, you know, shaped. Right, right, yeah, uh, you know, and, you know I, I didn't mention everything, but, uh, and the MRT people always, like, uh, uh, give me a shot, because, uh, I don't talk about uh, theater enough as literature. You know, I think with, I think with the performing arts, but it's you know it's literary. Uh, and um, you know, uh, Beat Generation play. You know, uh, you know, earlier than that, Maggie's Riff. You know, right, that right, was an right. original yeah. play. Yeah. And and so you know, uh, and then just you know, and and so many, you know. Uh, so many new books that you know you were part of, you know, bringing forward, uh, you know, working with John and and, uh, uh, and after, and and you still, you know, you know, all the publishing thing, you know, is also, you know, turning the wheel also, you know, uh, and uh, you know I know there's there's more more to come on that. Do you want to tell us what the next thing is? <laughs> What's that? Do you want to tell us what the next thing is? Well, uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. We just had Desolation Peak, which was yeah, all writings from that's great. Desolation yeah. Peak. And then now we have a uh, collection of his uh, short writings oh, right. called Self Portrait yeah. that spans his entire career. Um, that'll be out, uh, I'm hoping, in March, March 12th. Okay. Is that different than the books? <laughs> it's different than the books, yes. Okay, so so this, is, this is all unpublished. Yeah, oh, it's okay. um, oh, okay. selections uh, yeah. from this span, like I say, his entire uh, career. That's great. The bottom yeah. is well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's like I say, short short pieces. like People like, like short things now. Yeah, yeah. 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 Go on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Question. You alluded to his sports days in baseball, Tiger Field. <coughs> Thank you. Can you tell us where Tiger Field was located or is located? <laughs> well, I can tell you, and uh, at your own risk, you can believe it. <laughs> I've asked about it. Uh, the best answer that I got was uh, that. Uh, it was uh, in, on the edge of Pawtucketville where the Drake at Line uh, comes in. Uh, and you know, when he lived on like Sarah and Phoebe, uh, they, it would have been you know, behind, further, further out there. Apparently, you know, there was just some you know, you know, farmer you know, fields, whatever, that were uh, Nobody was doing anything with it, so the, the kids would uh, use that to play. It was it wasn't any kind of a you know like an official or an organized place. The same way that uh, I still don't know where Pine Brook is. You know, he writes about Pine Brook, which I, I think is like a little stretch of Beaver Brook up like over the hill in, in Pentagonville. Uh, but you know, it, it's you know. Drake and Tigers is now like a place in American literature. 
<laughs> so, but uh, that's the, the, you know, when I ask people who live in that area around that, you know, time, you know, they, they said it was just, that's what they call the, the field at the far end of uh, lower Pawtucketville there, like East, East Pawtucketville, you know, uh, out there right against like the Drake Line. One more question, anybody? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.